This is the Powered Up Podcast, show 20. The importance of even involving the kids in leadership roles, such as what do we want our classroom to look and feel like? Um, and then even some of our kids, they would take on, like we would have an anchor chart up of a student-led classroom, and what do we want that to look like? So you're right, like same thing, you could walk out of the classroom, like step out into the hallway real quick, and everything would carry on. Welcome to a real world education with insight and advice from teachers in the game, where current and former educators reveal what truly sets apart the great teachers and what it takes to make a positive impact on students. Whether you're in pre-service learning, new to the game, or a seasoned veteran, this is the show for you. You'll leave feeling inspired to take action because we are powering education by empowering you. Hope you've had a fantastic week. This is Ken Ehrman, host of the Powered Up Podcast, and I am here with my co-host, Mr. Matt, no voice or choice in his nicknames, Rogers. Oh, man. Matt, Matt, what is going on? How's your week been? My week is great. I am so happy to be sitting here in this chair right now with you. We are officially wrapped up uh, our state testing, not to date this episode, but um, it is the beginnings of May, and when this comes out, it'll probably be towards the end of the month, but we are now entering the best part of the year because routines have been set. You can have these expectations. You have all those things, and from this point forward, it becomes about wrapping up an incredible school year, an incredible experience with kids, and doing something really awesome that they're always going to remember. So. While that's a lot of pressure, um, it, it is a really exciting time of year, and, and I'm excited to be at that point. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I uh, I love this time of year as well, especially when I was when I was in the classroom. You know, in my role now as an instructional coach, I think my my excitement is with helping and encouraging teachers to try new things, look at some different strategies or ideas that they can they can explore, but also just um, seeing the excitement on the teachers that, you know, I, I don't think it's, I don't think teachers very commonly like wish for the year to be over. I think great teachers are excited to have every day they have with students, but this year in particular, 2020, 2021, I think everybody deserves a breath of fresh air and deserves that, that summer break students, parents, teachers, everyone, administrators, everyone and included. Um, but you talk about how you love this time of year and you actually get into this a little bit in our interview with a question, but I'm going to challenge you right now, Matt. What is something that you say for May because you know state testing is over, you have a well-oiled machine in your classroom, but what is something that you do with your students that you could do in November, but you don't currently? And that's kind of broad, but I think you know where I'm going with that. Yeah, so I brought up a question you'll hear about that just talks about bringing the creativity creativity into all facets of the school year because I think it's right now I, I like to call this my uh, my beta session where we're we're testing things out and seeing how the kids respond to them that I may consider as beginning of year activities. Hey, I have these robots. What can the kids go and figure out for me? What are ways that they're viewing? Um, and so in a lot of ways, uh, most everything I'm doing from here to the end of the year are hopefully things that next November I'm able to incorporate in my classroom. I know that's not a great answer for you, but um, to, to talk specifically, I think one of the benefits right now is we get to look at projects and activities in pulling from every concept area that we have taught in the year. So in math, it may be a culminating project. I know when we do our lesson plan activity, I talk about how we pull in uh, place value and rounding and area perimeter and um, geometry and all those skills that they've acquired throughout the year, they have to use to participate in that project, which is just, it's like the, the perfect whipped cream on top to the school year of saying like, 
hey, you really need to master a lot of instructional concepts in that time frame. But um, I don't know if I'm answering your question. The, the main thing about it is bringing more student choice, whether you make fun of me in the opening or not, student choice into every facet of teaching. And that all comes down to giving students opportunities to have choice and growing confidence that you know that that's a possibility the next group that you have. I agree. I think May is a great time to take risks uh, for two reasons. One, it's typically after state testing and, and whether or not you should feel that pressure, I'm not going to get into that conversation, but that pressure is there. And two, your students and you know your students best. There's that great rapport, relationship, management, routines, all, all those pieces. And so the resistance is, is lessened significantly because of that. What I would say to just the idea that you shared where you had that culminating project of concepts from multiple areas, curricular areas, is, you know, how can you do that in November? Well, they haven't learned all those skills yet. So how could you do it in November? If you perhaps dove a little bit into, so you teach fourth, if you dove into third grade a little bit more, what skills do they know or should they have, should they know and did they learn in third grade that I could weave a smaller version of that in October or November? Um, it might, it might be smaller because of, you know, the management routines and all those pieces, but just in in may allowing yourself to open yourself up to what does this experience look like and then building backwards to how do i create a smaller version of this um in november for me i would always take i would same way i would love taking risks and trying things in may and then and then kind of going back to how do i include this earlier so i was very regimented with my morning work time Students would arrive from bus or parent drop off uh, and until, you know, the first subject started where they went to special first thing after that announcement, there was a, a 20 to 30 minute window, depending if they were there for early care or they were an early bus or late bus, their, their time window changed. But I was very regimented with what they needed to accomplish in that time. And at the end of the year, I would loosen it up a little bit and give them more choice. I would have some more fun activities out there. They could read on their own. They could work on partner projects that we were wrapping up. And what I realized was the excitement in my room at 8.30 in the morning, which for a secondary teacher is almost halfway through your day, but for an elementary teacher is, is the start, the excitement in the room was off the charts. And so I thought to myself, how do I get this in September? I want this excitement from the beginning. And so... I eliminated all those really regimented activities that I had, and I built in that choice from the moment they walked in. And it was very scaffolded in the beginning. And, and our, our guest tonight, uh, Elizabeth Bost Bostwick, talks about scaffolding towards these student choice and in independent activities. But it was very scaffolded in my approach, but it all centered around choice. And so I would typically list, you know, here are some recommendations or here are some things that you should be working on. Or I had students that I told you have to do this because they were missing it or they were absent or whatever. But I told my students that I wanted their brains activated and I wanted them to just have a reason for what they were doing. If they wanted to come in and read quietly in the morning and I said, you know, Matt, why are you reading this morning? And it, they just responded and said, well, Mr. Ehrman, I don't owe you any work and I just feel like relaxing. Great. I love that because I was forcing them to make a choice. I wanted them to just make decisions consciously and understand why and having a reasoning behind that. And so that was something that I experienced in May and I, I brought back earlier in the year. Oh, gosh. I mean, that's really, I think the key question that you're that you asked a reflection, I guess is a better way to put it is how can I get that excitement in September? And I think too often we get accustomed with, I don't want to use these traditional timeframes as valuable timeframes. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but I know that three kids pop in to my classroom at 843, then five more kids come in at 
847. And then the rest of the class, but two or three are in by nine o'clock. But when you consider what I've provided the kids to do on the days or in those times that they're given busy work, yeah, they take their time to get down there. But if one of their activities that they're, oh, you know, the morning time's there for you to finish up any missing work that you're excited about, those kids are at their seats by 8.55 at the latest, and that's saying the last bus pulled in at 8.53. So I think that there's a, a huge element of utilizing that instruction, but it's also that reflection of how can I make this experience? And I think our, our guest, she just talks about how you set up an environment that the kids want to be there. And it's just an awesome episode. She just goes over some some incredible things. Absolutely. Liz, Liz really brings it tonight. Uh, a lot of practical ideas, which we're finding that we're getting out of our guests, which, which we love. Uh, but concepts that I think are applicable to any content, any grade level, uh, just ways to encourage more student independence, student choice and student voice, and, and developing those strong routines where you're setting up systems in place for success down the line. And so she, she talks about her book. Um, she talks about her experiences as a classroom teacher as well as a coach and consultant. So she's got a lot of, of wisdom and experience that she shares with us. And uh, I definitely encourage everyone to check out her website and her book, which can be found linked on our site at poweredup.com slash show20, uh, where you'll find all the details about about this episode. So um, I don't want to delay it anymore. Let's let's jump into that interview with Liz. Hi, Liz. Welcome to the Powered Up Podcast. How, how you doing tonight? I'm doing well. How are you? We're doing very well. We're super excited to have you here. So to start things off, just introduce yourself to our audience, uh, where you're coming from, and what your journey in education careers looked like so far. Sounds good. And thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited to talk with you guys tonight. So yeah, so I'm an educator of 16 years of classroom experience, um, grade between grades one and four. I've spent the most time in grades two and four. Um, I've really enjoyed teaching fourth graders. I think that's been one of my favorite grade levels to work with. Um, and then I worked as a grade level chairperson and then shifted into a role as an instructional coach and technology integration specialist. So, you know, taking all of the lessons that I've learned in the classroom and then work to coach teachers and work alongside them in the classrooms. Um, and right now I'm also um, working on, as a consultant and speaker. So I do some speaking with Ignite Your Shine, but I also do my own speaking and consulting with districts. Excellent. That's a, that's a, that's a great journey to go through. I feel like you've had the opportunity to really expand yourself. When you were when you were working in second grade and fourth grade, what were some of the commonalities that you found between the grade levels that you felt gave you an advantage because you had a, had experience with both of those grade levels, or just that outside perspective, you know, from compared to a teacher that's really been isolated in one grade level or one content area or even like one specific subject class that they're they're teaching i would say that some of the things that i found to be similar between the two that that really struck me is that no matter which grade you're working with you're really looking at um, focusing on teaching communication skills collaboration skills mm -hmm. um, even just knowing how to have solid routines in the classroom um, those were some of the things that I saw consistently between both grades that were something that I always focused on. And it was really neat going, so I went from fourth grade down to second and back to fourth. So it was really neat to be able to see, okay, well, here's some of the fundamental skills, or I know where they're going. So now I know some of the, why we're doing what we're doing within any content area. And then likewise, I, once the kids were in fourth grade, I was able to say, okay, I know where they've been. So I think that's always been insightful as well. I think that uh, that kind of having the progression or perspective of progression, A, is really comforting for us as teachers to say, like, I know that they're going to get these skills or they're going to acquire them as they move up uh, the grade levels. And when you're setting those foundational skills and those primary grades and seeing them really blossom in application um, when they get to that 
uh, mid-level elementary and obviously beyond, they can kind of explode from that point. Um, when talking about that idea, one of the things I was seeing is like, obviously there's, uh, to jump a little bit ahead, you have a, a book that you've written with an incredible acronym um, that just kind of represents a lot of what we would consider foundational concepts for teaching. Um, before really getting to the book side of things, can you talk to us about where that came from and maybe uh, the gist of the classroom side of things? Absolutely. So uh, the book really, um, so Take the Leap, and I know we can talk about it more as well, but um, the leap is an acronym. So the L stands for Luminous Culture, the E is for Empowered Learning, um, and the A is for Authenticity in Education so that we can reach our full potential. And so a lot of that for me was born from my experiences in the classroom, but also that as a parent. And so it was really looking at what we were doing in the classroom and how we could make it more authentic, how we could also create more student leadership and ownership in school. Um, and a lot of that was for the purpose of fostering intrinsic motivation. Um, you know, so many of us in the classroom and working alongside teachers or students, ultimately we want our kids to want to learn, right? We don't want to constantly be holding a carrot in front of them and like, okay, come on, do this next. Um, so a lot of what I did with the book came from my own experiences and really looking at how do we help kids foster a love of learning um, because I want them to not just love learning now but I want them to develop a lifelong love of learning. That's great. That was something that I was very passionate about. I know Matt, Matt as well as classroom teachers. Can you hit on one specific thing that we might read in the book um, that like really shows a a very concrete example of how, how you build that or how you teach that or inspire that with students because sometimes I would look back on it and feel like, hey, I'm actually doing a decent job. I feel like my students are intrinsically motivated or they do want to take risks. But if a teacher asked me, how are you getting them to do that? A lot of times I would struggle to, to come up with an example other than like it's the way everything operates. Can you give us uh, one of those examples? I really like how you said that, Ken, because I know there were so many times that somebody would come in my classroom and they would say something like, well, how did you look at how what they're doing or how did you get there? I'm like, well, this is just how, you know, we just went through the journey. And it just, to me, it just made sense, right? It's what I did year after year. It's the changes I made. So um, I think what I'm thinking when you ask that question is in the book, there's some concrete examples on first and foremost, as you know, and it's something that most of us as educators know, um, but is the importance of relationships, right? And we know that, but I'm guilty just as anybody else of sometimes going into the classroom and being like, oh my gosh, we have all of these things to accomplish, or, you know, this group needs this kind of instruction. And it's very easy to sometimes think about all of the to do's and all the things we need to get through. Um, whereas there's so much power if we actually just slow down sometimes and spend the time interacting with our students and doing the community building um, protocols or activities to develop that communication and teamwork and collaboration so that they can learn more effectively. So it's really looking at how we front load that. So in the book, what some of the things I talk about, for example, are, um, yes, the relationships, like taking time for one-on-one -on -one conversations with students, greeting them at the door, um, taught, working even in small groups, taking time to even have kids. Sometimes we would have small groups come in to lunch, for example. Um, we know that sometimes things are also different right now with COVID. But even if people are hybrid or in a remote model, there's still ways we, we know that we can meet within breakout rooms or still have touch points with students, which is incredibly important. Um, one thing that I didn't put in my book, but I wish I had, was just the concept of even doing um, empathy, enter, empathy interviews, excuse me, where we really ask kids, like, what do you love about school? Or what would you like to change about school? What's something that you think is a strength of yours? What's an area you think you could grow in? Um, but I think sometimes we don't always ask our students enough, what do they like about school or what they would like to change about school? And I think that's really insightful too. Um, in the book, I do focus a lot on the relationships and setting the culture for the classroom. So that looks like helping students understand accountable talk and routines in the classroom, using effective teaching protocols as well, such as 
for reflection and feedback. So I think those are all really important and they sound very basic, but when you do them with intentionality and also in a way that can also be fun in the classroom, you spark that love of learning and kids know what to be doing. And, and then they, they start taking ownership, which is the best part. That's a, just a, and I'll, I'll jump to Ken as much as you, um, but uh, one of the things that we love and we've been hearing through uh, our exploration of the podcast is just this concept of how we end up kind of building these attributes where the kids start taking more ownership of the learning and they kind of take over and we kind of learn through our practices of how we can step away with safeguards to allow kids to express their creativity, to talk about uh, things at layers of depth that we, even with guided questions in a scripted curriculum, could never get to. That that authentic learning comes, obviously, through the relationships. But what you kind of set out to do is explain what we as teachers often say is what we just do. And, and I think that's a really tough kind of concept of um, working with student teachers right now and the idea of saying like how did you get to this point and it's I got to this point because I established trust that if I hey put myself in a vulnerable position that they won't take advantage of it that isn't reconcilable so I know Ken and I talk all the time about how Ken created a classroom environment where he did a fairly, and not to, to minimize Ken's <laughs> efforts, but really was there almost passively very frequently because the kids were in a system that just functioned. And he did, and teachers like us did all of the work on the outside of creating high quality materials, examples, models, thought processes, that the moments that they're in the classroom, they are exploding with creativity and collaboration, what have you. Um, either one of you, can you kind of speak to what are those foreground items? Because that is something that if we could introduce that, introduce that to new teachers as early as possible, I think that's where we get to the point of saying, hey, we can turn the keys over and really create awesome classrooms. You can answer first, Elizabeth, but I okay. will jump in on that question. All right. I, was, I thought maybe I'm happy to go anytime. Um, you know, Matt, and, and some of the things, so we talk about trust and the relationships, right? And that sounds like simple, but it takes time to really build with kids. Um, one of the ways that I spend the beginning of the school year when I was in the classroom and also now working alongside teachers is working those first months, really focusing on we already mentioned routines, but then we also did a lot of team building protocols. Um, we would use adventure-based and experiential-based learning models. Um, what I really liked about those is that they were interactive, they were fun, the kids were able to problem solve, they had to work as a team. Um, through it, we would, I would learn a lot about the students, but they'd learn about themselves and others. Um, what was interesting, too, is that you also started to see communication patterns come out, like who was effective at communicating to solve a problem, for example, and who needed help. So we could take a pause, go into how do we talk through this, what does accountable talk look like. So we kind of, so instead of taking some of the pieces such as um, accountable talk or any conversation protocols or routines, and instead of doing that all embedded with an instruction, I began by embedding it within some of the community building activities that we did um, that were hands-on, experiential-based. And so that way, when we got to the, um, the point where we started with a little bit more content, some of that was already embedded. Um, and kids had already fostered some of those relationships with one another and myself. We got to laugh at ourselves. We got to um, discuss like what a growth mindset is. Like Sometimes we would fail through the problems. Well, how do we, how do we persevere? Um, so in talking about working with new teachers, that's one of the things that I often highly recommend is looking at how are we starting that school year off, you know? It's just really an important time to look at that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna steal one of your words that you highlighted, uh, but take it in a different direction. You mentioned trust. And for me, it was one building trust between myself and my students. But beyond that, it was trusting myself 
that the systems I was putting in place, the content that I was creating, whether it be a instructional screencast or a screencast on how to navigate the three steps of this process, the stations I set up, the experiments I set up, whatever it was, was trusting that I did do a good job in designing that. And if I didn't, I would learn from it and do a better next time. But really just letting it all happen to evaluate whether or not it was an effective lesson. And the more and more you design instruction like that and your routines that match around that, you will develop a trust with your students that they can handle it. It will, like you said, Elizabeth, like you said, Liz, it's going to take time because it's probably something different than they've ever experienced before with a previous teacher. So it takes time for them to trust themselves, trust you that you know what you're doing and you're not just this crazy teacher that lets kids, you know, do whatever they want. Um, but then also, like I said, trusting yourself that the process is going to work. And, and when you get all of those things meshing and it takes time and it takes risks and failing and evaluating, you know, that system really, it does, it does run like clockwork. Like I, the, the days that I would realize that things were working really, really well were, when there was an incident or something going on and my principal would pull me out of my class, to talk to me for 30 minutes in the hallway and I would come back in and, and nothing, nothing happened. Like, except the learning that always happens. There's or no way when... it was 30 minutes, Ken. Let's be <laughs> okay. Honest. Well, my principal likes to talk a lot, so, um, <laughs> but maybe it was shorter. We'll not, we'll not, uh, we'll not say it was that long, but, um, or like days I had a sub. You know, my sub plans got to a point in, in some of my last years teaching fifth grade where, like, I wrote, like, ten times, like, please understand that there will be many kids doing many different things. They're allowed to have laptops. Like, they're, please assume they're doing their work. Even if they're talking, just go check on them to make sure they are on task. And if I found that sub that would mesh and be okay with it, I would try to get them back as often as possible because it was probably the hardest room to sub in without any prior knowledge of, of what that room really looked like. And it, it just all circled around that, that idea of, of trust between the students and the teachers and the trust in the system from, from both of those, those parties as well. Um, Liz, you, you talked about communication a couple of times. What were some of the things that you felt you were able to – educate your students on in terms of their communication abilities and communication styles that maybe elevated their their maturity level or at least their maturity level in conversation that you felt was was really beneficial to their growth um so i'm going to answer that but i just can i piggyback off something you said earlier for just absolutely real quick? um i just wanted to say just when you're talking about just a well-oiled classroom like everything you said just reminds me of some of the things that excited me, like once you see your classroom up and running like that, there's nothing better. Cause you know, in the beginning of the year, you're like, okay, here we go. And it takes time, but when you get there, you know it. Um, and that's, what, you know, just thinking about some of the things you said too, is the importance of even involving the kids in leadership roles, such as what do we want our classroom to look and feel like? Um, and then even some of our kids, they would take on, like we would have a anchor chart up of a student led classroom. And what do we want that to look like? So you're right. Like same thing. You could walk out of the classroom, like step out into the hallway real quick and everything would carry on. Um, but that's also those routines that are in place too. And the kids just knowing. So I just, I loved hearing you talk. Cause I'm like, Oh, I want to go over right into your classroom. That sounds wonderful. You know? <laughs> um, so going back to communication and, how that impacted students. I think that it was really beneficial because instead of, for example, we have, we all have heard of the turn and talk, right? But I've oftentimes seen kids in classrooms both turn to each other at the same time and both talk at the same time. Or one student will talk while the other looks down or looks the other way. Um, so those are the things, like when we start seeing those behaviors in our kids, we know that they're turning and talking out of compliance, but they're not really turning and talking because they're engaged or even empowered to even care about this conversation at all. Um, so when I talk about accountable talk, it's more about they might have a question, but I would always encourage them to find something, like always either add on, um, you can respectfully disagree, but if you do explain why, um, if you agree with them, you could also 
explain why you agree. And again, you can add on to something. Um, but we also used talk moves in our classroom. So I also, if they weren't sure what they wanted to say, they had a hand signal for that too. So that they could just say like, I'm not exactly sure what I want to add on, um, but we would do this for like you and me, like if we agreed with each other too. So um, that was a way like, kind of saying a couple things at once. So of course, going back to the turn and talk real quick, it was just really important that when the kids could turn and talk, that not, they were either agreeing or disagreeing or adding on to one another, but then um, able to contribute back. So when they shared back with the classroom, I would have one partner share and they were responsible to share for both people if they were able to do that. And if they couldn't remember, they're like, oh, you can add in. And they were confident because we built the culture. Um, but additionally, if we were doing something in the classroom, we would use talk moves too. So that if somebody was thinking the same thing as somebody else that had said something, like I said, you could do the you and me, um, or they could give a thumbs up if they wanted to add on to something, um, which was also, instead of, we always said, like, we don't need to do high hands in the classroom. We don't need to raise our hands. We can use our talk moves to communicate and then either add on um, or agree to somebody. But I think what I really liked about the conversation is that they would learn, even through Socratic seminar, when we find when we would get to the point of being able to host those, um, we saw kids not have major disagreements, but they were nine-year-olds that were having deep, rich conversations in a mature way. Um, and they were able to use evidence and be able to back up what it was that they were conversing about, and they were genuinely engaged in the conversation. So. That's why I think that communication routines are really important, too, in the classroom. So I want to pick your brain for a second on, on this topic of, of class conversations and discussions. Something that I've, I've recommended this year to especially our secondary teachers that I'm working with more is to encourage more participation in a class discussion or more participation from those particular students that you are confident has really good ideas, they're just not confident enough to share, is the use of a discussion board or a Padlet or a Google Jamboard, whatever the case is, some sort of digital platform where everybody has to have an entry level thought or idea. And then either the teacher can use that to pick a few students. So when they see that that student they know normally has a good answer, does have a good answer and they don't accidentally call them the one time they don't or requiring the class to stem off of one of the thoughts in that initial board. Do you like that idea? Do you have advice to improve that idea or? No, I love that idea and you're right. Google Jamboard is great. I know um, with the district that I was most recently working with, um, we were using Nearpod because you can have the sticky notes and you can choose to hide student names too. And I, I know on Jamboard you don't see the names, but um, I, I just like when the students know that they can contribute in a safe way. So I love the idea of having everybody contribute something, even if they don't have, even if they're not confident in their answer, but that's where that trust comes in, right? Like every student should trust my teacher is not going to embarrass me. They're not going to put something up there. Um, or, you know, and sometimes we might use something as an example. I mean, it could be a math problem that was solved in incorrectly, but of course we're not going to point out, hey, this is incorrect. We could say, hey, let's look at this math problem, for example, and assess where did the error ha happen? What was the misunderstanding? So now that creates some deeper conversation. But I do like the idea of having all kids accountable to contribute something um, and giving it them a way to do it that's safe so that they can be a little bit vulnerable and know that they're protected is a good way for the teacher, too, to get insight in what the student's thinking. And I think just that communication system allows for you as a teacher to have a better understanding of your student's understanding without big like I, I I feel like there are times that I go in and I play uh, to get out the doors or whatever the case may be whether it's quizzes cahoots gim kits those type things the Socratives that seem like a lot of work that don't always like lead into um, the questions that we want because it's mostly multiple choice based that you're not getting the feedback that you need to get their understanding and if you have that culture to feel comfortable to pull hey it's that classic hey i i grabbed three different writing examples and we're going to evaluate how would we grade them under their um kind of uh i guess the permission of the kids that you know or you're pulling from but there's a reason why those type activities 
are super important and it's that educational talk or the the math talk or the reading talk or the the concepts that go into it that we never make nearly enough time about often we get to the surface level of vocabulary and these level of item, items and I was doing one recently where we picked a, a pretty good writing piece and we enhanced it and it wasn't even a bad piece but it's everyone's contributing to say okay what could we add to this to make it even better and then you have a collaborative group of kids all mentally thinking through the process of oh the next time I write I want to consider the author's voice or whatever the case may be those opportunities um, a lot of times I know uh, just working with other teachers the ticket out the door system that is just simply one word answers or classroom conversations that are again not based off higher order thinking um, really make it seem like you have an understanding but you don't always have a true understanding i think that's that's one of the hard things and just kind of looking at um, when when you progress to these kind of exceptional projects where the kids can take it in many directions if you are not able to clue in those little things I think that's a big warning to make sure you have those foundational skills of knowing how you can pull out the instruction or honestly redirect back to the core instruction. I know right now we're doing an activity um, where the kids are, re are mapping uh, instructional concepts through the year. So uh, we have a group of two kids that are doing the path of electricity. So we have a little Ozobot robot that's going through the path of electricity. So they go through the load, they go through the cell, they go through the wires, they talk about different circuits. And in the same activity, I have someone retelling the story of a book. And what I found in that conversation was we started the project, and Ken would be very mad at me how I did it, uh, we started the project with very little guidelines, but not nearly enough structure and not nearly enough um, guidance. And what I found is I was like, oh, we've all done those projects that you repeat. I have a one uh, where they all build the same flashlight, it seems. You show one example, everyone builds it. Um, this one, they needed that guidance. So it's one of those that you have to play and you have to really be in tune and I had to apologize and say, hey, your first attempt was not nearly what I'm looking for. This is, without hurting their feelings, saying we're kind of going back to the drawing board and taking a, a left-hand turn and, and going for a different direction. But that is all built out of a culture and an understanding that we're going to have tough conversations, we're going to try things, and we're going to make adjustments along the way. Yeah, I think that's, you know, just part of life, too. You know, sometimes we think it, something that we're doing is going to go a certain direction and it doesn't go the way we want. So, you know, that's helping kids to understand, like, how do we, instead of just forging ahead, how do we slow down? How do we reflect on what's going on and then refine or retool what it is that we're doing? So, you know, that's just, those are one of those life skills that I think we need in any area of our, of our lives that would be beneficial. So, uh... Based on what you said at the very beginning of that, Matt, I'm going to throw out a quick tip for our, our listeners. So we've talked about Google Jamboard a couple times. If you've never heard of Google Jamboard, it is a blank whiteboard. You can put on sticky notes, text boxes, shapes. You can draw on it, especially if you have a touch screen. The drawing works very well. And you get to it through your Google Drive. You click on New. You scroll past Docs, Slides, Sheets, Forms, go to More, and then you'll see Jamboard. When you create it, you can share it out edit as anyone can edit or anyone can view. So you talked about how sometimes it's hard to have those exit tickets prepared. So here's something that you can do so you always have an exit ticket or a mid-lesson check available. You create a blank Google Jamboard. You share it as everyone can edit. You paste it in your LMS, Google Classroom, Schoology, Canvas, doesn't matter. Just tuck it somewhere where the students typically don't go. And any time on a whim, when you realize you need a check-in, you need an exit ticket because you didn't prepare one, you say, everybody jump to this spot in our, our LMS and add a sticky note on blank or whatever the case is. You could even have one where it forces a copy to every kid if you want an individual one versus a collaborative one. Just leave them tucked in there. You might not use it for a week, two weeks, and then the day you use it, you just make another one 
where you delete all the responses or, or whatever the case is. Because like you said, Matt, it's it's so hard to prepare that every single day. Um, so I, I feel like there's a student voice and student choice, Liz, based on everything you've told us about your classrooms and the, and the teachers you would have been coaching and, and your book, it's got to be a huge part. So what are some misconceptions that you feel are out there around student voice and student choice and and how would you define it in a classroom? So I think that sometimes the misconceptions are, um, for example, sometimes, and, and it can be this too, but sometimes the, the misconceptions is that student voice just means that they have a choice in what order of the work they want to do, you know, and we might have a menu of things, and I've done that myself. So, but it's more than that. So I think that, that it's not just that. So I would say um, that to begin with. But I think that when it comes to student voice and choice, we're really looking at empowering the student and and engaging them in incorporating what they're interested in as well. Um, So for an an example, we've done project-based learning. So with that, kids got choice. Like I created the launch activity, and but then they went and did their own essential questions. So they had their own question. Um, and then they worked in, they partnered up in teams, and from there they started working on projects together. Um, and that's a whole big element right there. But within that, when we're looking at the student choice aspect, they got to choose what question it was within um, the topic that they were going to research. Then they got to choose what expert they wanted to involve. They chose how they wanted to present it. And then when we're talking about student voice, That's also, it's all incorporated within there, but it's also looking at how are they sharing that work? So what are they doing with their voice to share that work? How do they want to um, get out their their ideas to the world? Um, So we're looking at it in all those different ways, but even if it's not project-based learning, it doesn't have to be within project-based learning, but it can even be in the classroom just starting out the day. We also did the first 15, 20 minutes, kids had choice in what they wanted to do to start their day. Um, and it could look, we had, there was coding, there were computer activities, there were writing. Um, we had different groups where kids got to contribute to our online newsletter. Um, and that again, incorporates student voice where, you know, they're the one there, it's their voice on the student newsletter. It's their videos. They're the ones, um, creating a lot of the content, but I'm there more as the guide on the side. So I was doing more of the facilitation. And of course we didn't start that in September, you know, I mean, it takes time to get there. Um, but when we're looking at student voice and choice, we're really looking at helping the kids to not just feel like they're making a choice within the bubble that the teacher is giving, but they're legitimately contributing to the classroom, things that they think are interesting um, or that they think are just really important that they want to focus on. I want to I wanna hit on a, a quick topic of this. We know there's going to be students that can't handle this as soon as the rest or that can handle it and then they fade away and then they need to be pulled back. Uh, I'm going to say discipline, but that might not be the best word to use, but how do you discipline or recenter or get these few students that just aren't mature enough or ready enough to have this amount of choice and independent time? How do you, how do you navigate that with, with those students? So, I feel like, you know, kids are obviously going to vary in any classroom. And in my classroom, I had kids with all different, a wide variety of needs. So it wasn't like we were, um, you know, I know sometimes people will break up classrooms and say, oh, these are my advanced group. We weren't, we didn't, we were just an average classroom, you know, um, but, but I think they were doing spectacular things as an average classroom. But, you know, I think for the kids who may struggle with feeling like there's um, different options, I, I guess here's where I'm going to go with that, is that in the beginning of the year, you know which kids are going to struggle a little bit more. And they may there may still be an ebb of flow, ebb and flow of their struggling throughout the year. Um, but that's why I focus so much early on with those routines. So as much as there's voice and choice built in, it's within a structure of routines that are fairly predictable. Um, the even students learned to lead some of those routines themselves. And I would oftentimes start with my students who were more confident at leading those routines, and then they might co-lead those with other kids who didn't feel as confident. 
Um, and then eventually we would really support the other kids who might not be as confident to be leaders in that way. Um, whenever we did have a student who might just be having an off day, maybe they're struggling um, to collaborate with others, maybe they just need space, we also had a mindfulness corner in our classroom and kids knew how to use it. So we had kinetic sand, we had Play-Doh, we had bubbles. The bubbles did not always come out. It really just depended on the year, depending on the season, um, and what we were looking for, and kids would set a timer. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to go avoid my work or escape everything, but it, there was an opportunity for kids to decompress and then return, and they knew they were going to return. Um, but there's also times that I might myself go and work with a small group when I know that a student might need extra support and maybe social emotional support. They just might need that extra person there. So, you know, I think it looks different for every student, um, but I also think it's about scaffolding the resources that we have too. So sometimes a kid, it, it, and I think that's what's a little bit tricky about the question is that, you know, there's so many different reasons why a child might be checking out of something. Something might feel too difficult. There could be something going on at home. There could be um, something going on socially with peers. So I think being present helps, giving them the opportunity to be mindful, and then just knowing that some of the resources, they different kids might need unique resources to support them. Um, and then, of course, if we ever need to have individual in conversations with students, then that's always an option as well. That's a, a ton of great points, but I, I, I think really what comes out of that is a lot of those challenges, even with your kids on the fringe of are they going to be successful or not, that intrinsic motivation bump really brings them to the playing field that they are wanting to do everything in their power uh, to be successful. Um, Liz, you have on your website, which your website is beautiful, by the way, I would highly suggest checking out. There's a ridiculous amount of resources I was checking on, um, but you have a, a visual representation of your book. And there's a few points I just want to bring up and just have you speak to, I'm assuming, um, come up and even your presentations. Um, so first off, I love the concept of brainstorm, uh, which is at the center, uh, first alone and then share with the group. And I think that there's something that we think of uh, when, when working in collaboration, that collaboration always has to be a joint conversation without the opportunity to really develop your own thoughts on a really deep concept. Um, I, I think just that in its own right is a huge concept that we need to remember ourselves. There's plenty of conversation in this or, or topics about uh, focusing on on the kids and the kids need to develop these ideas to then share to them. Can you kind of talk about that real quick? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I find that I'm, I think a lot of us are like that too. Like you get together and it sounds like, oh, we're all going to brainstorm together. But sometimes we just benefit from like getting in our own mind and being able to think through some of the things we're thinking about and ha having our own ideas and writing those down. And, and with students, we would do a lesson um, with What Do You Do With an Idea by Komi, Kobe Yamada. There's a great book on that. Um, and we would read that book, and the kids would then be encouraged to share their big ideas. But, of course, you ask a bunch of kids what are your big ideas, and sometimes you'll just get blank stares. So um, we wouldn't just ask that. We would read the book, and I would always acknowledge, like, I bet all of you in here have had a big idea. You might not think you have. And some kids, I've even read this book to sixth graders um, in an urban district, and they're looking at me like, uh, you know, no big ideas. I'm not having a big <laughs> idea. And I'm like, no, you're going to have a big idea. I'm sure you've had one. Um, and so they would just get alone time. We'd put music on and they would just start, they could write down ideas. They could just doodle. They could draw. Um, and then they would pick one and just go with it. They don't have to be committed to it. Um, but with that, for example, with that brainstorming concept, what was really neat is that they would come to the table with something. Um, and then what we would do is we'd share them and then kids would build on those ideas with one another. So it was more of a process. And then again, they come back to themselves and do more reflecting. So I think a lot of times in the classroom, same thing, even if we're doing something with an ELA, uh, we could be doing something with themes, something with main idea. We still can do our own independent brainstorm, write down our own thoughts and then come together and then share what some of our ideas are with that too. Yeah. And I think I love right next to it, you have how your idea is too big, said no leap teacher ever, which is really like, and sometimes it's difficult to narrow it down. And honestly, as someone new to PBL or 
um, trying to incorporate some authentic learning experiences, it's intimidating to say, how are we going to deal with pollution on Earth? Uh, okay, we can we can narrow down and, and identify different facets, and that's an important thing. Um, but you have one quote that I'll add to it, and then kind of lead it over to you guys. But I want to I want to jump in real quick. Sorry, oh, just on that me. just right. on that topic. Of, sorry, on that topic right. of brainstorming. Even just to simplify that idea, just as a reminder, how important wait time is. You know, so often we don't provide the students an opportunity to just think and develop the answer, develop the idea themselves before you're calling on someone. And one of my, one of my favorite lessons that um, really, really made me realize how important this was, was I would, I had a, like a scaffolded, almost like scavenger hunt that from pictures to uh, number expressions, if the students had enough time, they could figure, they could in quotes, figure out how to add fractions with different denominators. And if I gave them enough time, 95% of them would figure it out. And what flipped it for me was I, instead of saying, okay, like I need the last 20 minutes of class to teach everybody, I just screencasted, you know, again, in quotes, the answer of how to do it. So whether they took five minutes or 45 minutes of the 50 minute lesson, they all were able to then get to that screencast and providing all of them that time, like you're saying that brainstorm time had such a huge impact on their understanding moving past that lesson. So anytime you can really give each student time in their own head is, is, is so valuable. I just, I just love that concept. It is. Sorry, Matt. Uh, And and so one of the key things is uh, that it posted there is just allow students going along with what you're saying, Ken, Um, as well as yourself, time to ponder. And just like that idea of really thinking and creating space for it, because especially right now, we're moving at a million miles an hour. And then that leads, especially in this maker world, into the design thinking process, which is really taking the situation you're trying to fix, whether it's a real world problem or uh, a pretty simple solution in your life, or even a, a instructional concept and creating a way to set purpose for what you're building. So it it really, when talking about moving into this um, exceptional style of teaching, where you are putting it more in the kids' hands, that structure of really pushing design thinking and creating wait time that's purposeful and really monitoring those type things is, is difficult, but that is that intrinsic motivation when we first went to voice and choice when you were talking is the key to it. When you empower those kids, you create so much intrinsic motivation and the results are so far beyond what you would ever have accepted, expected when you spelled out everything out on the rubric. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when it comes to design thinking, I, that's one of the things I spe- specifically work on with school districts is how we integrate and design thinking into the classroom and that it doesn't have to just be STEM. In fact, I just spoke at the Wisconsin Reading Association about how we can integrate design thinking even within literacy to create innovative thinking, joy, and creativity in our students. So, and yeah, anytime our kids can be in their own heads and thinking about it is awesome because sometimes we see kids who may lack some confidence and just feel like, oh, I'm just going to let them answer it. And I'll just go along with the group where they may have some spectacular idea inside their mind that they never got out. Or maybe they don't even, they hadn't even had the idea yet because they didn't even think about it. So giving that wait time, as you mentioned too, Ken, is so important. Um, But then we don't want to just have them in their own head. And as we all know, it's the importance of then sharing it and growing it and diving into those conversations and especially using design thinking with it. Can I, can I give you a challenge real quick? Sure. Um, so I know we're recording this. Um, today was my last day of uh, state testing, which I'm very excited about that it's over. And we have 24 more days of school to which I have realized that I've held off from some of this exceptional opportunity Um, since really like the beginning of the winter season because we naturally fall into these ruts of like pushing curriculum over experience. So I don't necessarily, I think 
we get a lot of support on how do we incorporate it when you get to know students at the beginning of the year. And we also see some exceptional projects at the end of the year as we're kind of wrapping up. Can you kind of speak to how you incorporate it in the heart of the school year, the middle where you're feeling the pressure of all the curriculum you need to cover, but you also want to continue to provide the best quality instruction for kids? And also, can you just uh, define what design thinking is first as well? So design thinking, I'll begin with that. So design thinking is an iterative process for creating and making. Um, and it's oftentimes to solve a problem. So we might see this, um, you, you could use something with a paper airplane just to keep it real simple. Like I want to design a paper, well, I don't necessarily love that idea also because with design thinking you want to start with empathy, although we can go with this. So let's say we have a paper airplane um, and we have a child and this child wants a paper airplane and the paper airplane is not flying. It just keeps nose diving. So what we would do is we're not empathizing with the paper airplane, we're empathizing with the user. The user is the child who is feeling frustrated and wants to create this amazing paper airplane. Um, so through this, we're gonna then define the problem. We're gonna identify what the problem is and then start ideating. We start, we wanna come up with all the ideas, how can we improve this? But it could be even um, how to solve a problem, something that doesn't exist too. So I know I'm using the basic concept of a paper airplane, um, but it could be that the kids are completely inventing something too um, to solve a problem. But we'll stick with what we're going with. Um, so the kids then, once they go through the ideate phase and they've listed and gone crazy brainstorming and coming up with all their, and this is where I tell kids, go have big, wild, crazy, audacious ideas. Like there's no idea that's too big. Just be wild with it. Um, and then they start narrowing down on which one they wanna go with. From there, they would then, they could sketch out and then design a prototype. So it could be a sketch, it could be a drawing, it could be a tangible item. Um, and then ideally we wanna test it. Now, because design thinking is iterative, with that testing phase, with the, obviously with a paper airplane, you could test it. Now, if you're creating, you're doing um, design thinking with something within literacy, it may be a sketch and your test would be sharing, doing a jigsaw with peers in the classroom where you do like a 30 second um, elevator pitch for what it is that you created to solve a character's problem, for example, and then you get 30 seconds or a minute of feedback. Um, to go back so you could do that as well um, but design thinking is really a process and it doesn't always have to go in that order too you might skip back around so if you do a prototype and you're not happy maybe you need to go back and go back to your the ideate phase and look through your ideas and refine that maybe you need to even define do a better job defining the problem um, so that's design thinking in a nutshell but it really helps kids to be able to design and, and even my work that i've done with pbs education um, when we've done virtual professional learning series with teachers, we've used design thinking to design um, virtual professional learning series for teachers, always empathizing first with what are the needs of the educator, right? And then going through defining the problem and so on, so on and so forth. Um, so Matt, to respond to your question with how do you do all this in the midst of everything going on in the year and everything that you're teaching and all the expectations and the standards and and all of that. And so those are all realistic things. So one of the things, like because we did elements of makerspace, we've done project-based learning, but that doesn't mean that um, we're doing everything all year long. It doesn't mean that you can't either because there are teachers who are um, have the support and the resources to be able to do that. But if we're talking about a general classroom and our teacher is used to you know, going through the blocks of the day and saying, hey, my district expects 90 minutes of ELA, 60 minutes of math, we may have blocks of time. And that's the reality of some schools that we're in. So in that case, we can still have all of the content that we're doing throughout the year, but we're kind of looking at redesigning some of the lessons that we're doing. Now, if you're in a position, which some people are, where they have a very scripted curriculum. I've worked with districts who have very scripted curriculum um, and almost have to be on the same page as the teacher next door. That also gets a little bit more complicated. Um, but I still say that even in, there, in that type of a situation, we always wanna be looking at how to be responsive to our students in the classroom. Um, I've seen some teachers when 
design thinking is new to them or anything, even if it's voice and choice, you know, something that to you and I might seem like this is a natural part of our routine, but to somebody else, if it's new, we say start small, right? And grow your confidence in it. Um, give yourself time. You don't need to go all in. Um, sometimes the greater, the more we step outside of our comfort zone, the more confidence we grow in that. And so we want to see that run smoothly. But I always look at like the biggest bang for my buck. So I'm always looking at if I can do something like design thinking in the school year. And this is like even recently we talked about it within literacy, specifically within fiction. You can still be teaching all of your standards. It doesn't have to take longer to do. So you know, I think it's that's where you want to sit down and look at some lesson designing together. Yeah, and I think that's, those are great points. I think one of the, the big fears often comes into the duration of time. And that also comes back to that culture of respect and, and you know, hey, we're exploring it now. But kids, and this is something that I always need to remind myself of, kids have a lot of time on their hands that if they take a little bit more and they choose to do something for school that they're excited about or intrinsically motivated to continue and showcase after the fact, that is the ultimate win for a teacher. Um, so I, I think that's a, a huge encouragement of saying, how can you rein this in? Well, you set the, the minimal expectations, you allow them to get creative, but you also kind of support them to have check marks and create those guidelines. But uh, I know, as you're mentioning, starting small is a great way to first acknowledge what uh, the time frame is. That is one of the hardest things to really have a grasp on because you, you run with an idea and it becomes a massive thing very easily. Well, and also just to speak to that, what you said, though, is that, you know, there do have to, there, we need constraints in there, too. And constraints can actually help us to become more creative. Sometimes if you say you have all the time in the world to work on this, it might sound great, um, but constraints can actually help with creativity. So it's okay to say, hey, I'm going to do, we're going to, I mean, really, we want to make sure that voice choice and student autonomy, that should be part of our natural classroom routine as is, you know, building trust and relationships. But if we're talking about routines such as design thinking, maybe it's something that you're doing a little bit on Wednesday and revisiting on Friday. Um, you can also set parameters for the time blocks. And maybe people don't always finish everything in one time like maybe it's the first time doing design thinking and we reflect on it and we grow as a class so there doesn't always need to be that finite product there likewise when we did project-based learning um, i've seen one team take a project and i think that i want to say that they they spanned it from almost the beginning of the year to almost the end of the year kids petered out with that project because it was almost too long um, whereas i know the team that i worked with one of the best projects I think we did, I think we kept it within a two week time frame. Maybe it was three weeks, but we made sure that it was kept within that time frame. And of course, that's not what we were doing all day long either. Um, but those, like you said, the checklist, the deadlines, they need to be in there. Of course, somewhat flexible too, depending on what's happening in the classroom, but um, those are all really important. So it does not mean a free for all. It doesn't mean like you're just keep going with something forever. Definitely, and I, I love that you included empathy in defining the design loop because i feel like it's so often left out i feel like it more and more people are realizing how important it is but even you know thinking about you know matt when you were asking how do you incorporate this into your instruction think about just small pieces of the design loop and just building that vocabulary into your conversation you know ela if you're reading a fictional story or you're looking at you know whatever whatever you're reading in that class just ask a question that is approached from a, a perspective of empathy. You know, what do we think the character is feeling in this moment? Or how could we, if we were in this book, how could we act empathetically towards this, this character? Or identifying a problem. What's the problem the character is facing? And, and just reminding the students that this relates to the design loop. Or, all right, let's everybody stop here. Let's design some solutions, brainstorm solutions that the character could use in this moment. And then kind of circle through that ideate phase, like you were saying, and then continue reading the story. So small ways to insert it into your curriculum, social studies and science, 
not to say anything is easy, but I think that'd be a little bit easier because you can look at situations where, you know, let's look at what this country was facing. If this one leader used the design loop to analyze this situation, what ideas would they come up with or what better ideas could we come up with it? So just circling the vocabulary in there. So when you approach Liz, like you said, those two week projects, you're not defining the terms and rolling out the project. You're rolling out the project because they already understand the terms. Absolutely. I love that you added that in because I think that's something when, when teachers feel like, Oh, I can't do this. This is too much. It's because they're diving right into that. Um, and so, yeah, stepping back, using the vocabulary, doing it in small bits, even doing it something like, as a, um, like you said, STEM is a very natural fit as a social study. So, you know, doing something smaller like that and even cohesively as a class and then breaking it up and moving into teams, kind of doing that gradual release or scaffolding, depending on the needs of your classes is always helpful. Definitely. So. I could talk about this for hours, but I, I want to be conscious of our time. So we're going to transition into our lesson lens to just try to get a picture of, of a lesson that you taught or perhaps you helped coach or, or mentor with someone else. So the first question is, is this a single lesson, a long-term project, or a unit overview that we'll be looking at today? Okay, so we're going to be looking at a single lesson. All right, and the grade level, subject area, and if it was a specific time of year. Um, it was time of year. We are going to go with the fall. Um, so the subject area would kind of incorporate some ELA skills of speaking and communication, um, but it's not specific. It's more of a, it's, I, I already kind of hit on it a little bit with what you do with an idea. So that's kind of the lesson I'm going to dive into a little bit more. Awesome. And is there a particular grade level that this works with or would it be pretty much modifiable for anyone? I think, I think it would be modifiable for just about any grade, um, even up through high school. I mean, yeah. Okay, perfect. So what are... You kind of hit on this, but any more details you want to add? What are the objectives of the lesson? Okay, so my objectives of the lesson are to help the help kids understand that they have unique strengths in the classroom um, and that every one of them has important and unique ideas that they can share with the world. And so through this lesson, some of the things I'm looking for is for students to develop their own confidence, to be able to develop their own ideas. Um, and it's really a lesson that I find is one of my favorites to work with with kids. Um, it's one that even as an instructional coach, um, I would support with doing in the classrooms. And the reason we loved it so much is because it helped kids um, develop, first of all, culture and an understanding of what they have to offer. It helped them to brainstorm and fostered that confidence in students. That sounds wonderful. Speaking really specifically about the students' ends, uh, what are they actively doing? Like, what are some of the um, activities that you had the students doing throughout the lesson? So to begin with, I do read the book of What Do You Do With an Idea by Kobe Yamada. And in that, we, we do integrate literacy into it because, of course, we'll use questioning and inquiry during the read aloud. Um, but we also use the illustrations to say, what do you notice about the illustrations? Um, it's a great book if you haven't read it, and I'll just give a little bit in a nutshell, but the main character has an idea, and it's illustrated as what looks like to be an egg in the book. And the character doesn't want this idea, wants the idea to leave him alone, but the idea keeps following him. And it's almost like the idea wants to keep getting his attention. And he's like, nope, I don't want you anything to do with you. Um, but eventually he starts to nurture this, I, what he calls his idea, which looks like an egg. Um, the book starts blooming with color and the egg sprouts feet and even develops a crown. And so the more he nurtures and takes care of this idea, the more this idea grows into something absolutely beautiful and wonderful. And by the end of the book, he doesn't know what he would ever do if he didn't have that idea. So it's really, and even with adults, I mean, Adults, even more than kids, sometimes have ideas that they hold inside because they think, I'm not worthy enough, or who am I to have this idea, or I can't possibly make this happen. Um, but clearly, all of us have that ability. I love it. 
I'm definitely going to read this book. I We used a lot when I taught STEM. Uh, I taught STEM as a isolated special. Um, we used a lot of a lot of books like this, picture books to spark ideas. Like I did see on your website. Um, I th did you have It's Not a Box on there? Were you at? No. I might, yeah, was, under uh, the maker. I had a yeah, yeah. Maker so yeah. D using those books to spark those lessons, I, I love those ideas. So um, during this lesson, what is your role to ensure the success of the students? So ultimately, my role is creating that routine. So we develop the routine. The kids know the structures. Um, I'm using the learning protocols. Um, we even do like we do a lot of visible thinking routines. So I highly recommend looking up visible thinking routines. You can find that just by simply Googling. Um, See, think, wonder is one of my favorites. So we could even take a, pic a page of the book and the kids can write down what do they see? Um, what do they think? And now what does that make them wonder? Now, I've done this, and just because if listeners listen in and go ahead and try that, their kids might be like, okay, I saw something, and I thought something, I'm not wondering anything. Um, but if you give the, again, it's about wait time, you give a little bit of time and just say, well, eventually you'll write something down, and eventually they do. And what's neat is that the more they sit there with it, the more things they actually wonder, which fosters that curiosity. And kids need that curiosity to actually be deeply engaged and be empowered in their learning. So with this lesson, although I incorporate literacy standards within it, it's really focusing on um, cultivating the culture in the classroom and helping kids to understand that they have those big ideas um, and working with them through the protocols and routines that just help them to be more curious. That sounds awesome. Um, I guess the, the main question this uh, would be is if you were to have um, the ability to enhance it in any way, um, make it even better, or if you were to teach it again um, upcoming, are there any adjustments that you'd make to, to go even further with it? Well, so I'll finish sharing kind of what we do with that lesson. So I shared a little bit of what we do. Um, the kids do their own brainstorm of like their different ideas and then they select one. They go through and then they share that with other people within their group. I keep the group small on purpose so that they feel safe and comfortable. We keep it to a minute, just three, about three students per group and they begin sharing their ideas. Um, and then in that way, the kids can ask questions. We, do, we never provide feedback at that point. It's just, tell me more about it. Or the kids can be like, explain this more. Or um, how does this work? So it's all about have, getting the kids to ask questions. So now again, this is what's helping the kids to learn how to use inquiry themselves um, and not be judgmental or develop critique right away. Um, and then so from there, then kids would further go, they would take that and they would go back and develop their idea. So some of the things that we've done is we've then incorporated writing with it. So the kids would, so I'm kind of fast forwarding the lesson. So they would take their idea, whatever it might be, like kids have invented all kinds of contraptions from like bedroom cleaning robots to something that helps you with your homework, you know, classic things that some kids will think about. Um, but some kids have even thought about different like, um, devices to solve different problems as well that we've had like a glowing collar for their cat so they could see it outside um, that would even do like different noises so the cat would know when to come back so they would have all kinds of ideas and they would sketch that out um, and then we would do a writing activity and then we would incorporate the literacy skills so the kids were also doing writing working in complete sentences and punctuation um, and then i would say the last thing so you're asking what we would do different um, the last thing that we did do, we, so we did this in the beginning of the year, and one of the last years of my teaching, what we did is we took, the kids created videos with, so they had the writing portion, the drawing portion, but then there was a video of them talking, and we put a QR code so that the parents could come in and scan it and listen to their child. So it was much more interactive. Um, I think, though, that if I was to do this again, I would create the opportunity um, to maybe get out, get their ideas out more into the world, um, to be able to maybe share out some of their ideas on social media, maybe tag people in the industry that could um, share back, like feedback to the students, or even just to say, I love this idea, tell me more. Um, you don't always get responses, but sometimes you do. Um, 
I mean, we've done things in our classroom where kids have reached out. We've did letters of inspiration, and we heard back from a dance company from New York City, for example, which was neat. They got the student got a bunch of goodies sent, like a dance bag and a pin and a sticker. So that was really neat. Um, so I think I would have made it so that the kids put, were able to put their voice out there and have a greater audience than just their parents coming at open house, for example. That's great. It's it's so hard to do with those, but it's when you do give them that larger audience, it, it really has a profound effect on their motivation. And, and just like you said, even if only one of one student or even a small group got that response from the dance company, everyone else in the class is going to see that and think like, wow, you know, maybe that'll be me next time, or maybe my person's going to respond soon. Or, Hey, remember when that person responded to you back when we were in fourth grade, like they'll remember those things, even if it wasn't, wasn't them specifically. I really enjoyed that. So our last section of the show is the exit ticket. Four questions that we ask all of our guests every week. Question number one is, what is the best thing a teacher can do to make a student's school experience better? I'm going to go with the simple, um, develop a relationship with your students and always assume positive intent. Mm. I like that. Wow. I like that second part. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what's the best advice you've gotten uh, along your teaching career? And it could be from a colleague, a supervisor, or even a student. I think just allowing the students to be able to contribute to the classroom. Um, so years ago, um, I've worked with a great principal and he had great ideas for just empowering student voice in the classroom too. So I think incorporating that, always looking at how we can do that is always powerful. Excellent. So we talked about this a little bit earlier, but the school goes in waves. There's really stressful times, like Matt said, that center of the year where you're feeling the push of curriculum, conferences, report cards, what have you. What is something that you want all teachers to hear in those personal moments to help them power up and, and rise above that? Yeah, and, and I think that everybody has felt that this year. My husband himself, he's a principal. I know administrators are feeling it just like classroom teachers are. I think everybody in every role. Um, I think that what I would say is that in the moment, sometimes it's important and okay to give yourself permission to step away, even if it's for two to five minutes. Go outside, get some fresh air, and just center yourself. Get yourself in a place where you feel some peace and calming. Um, and then the other thing is, is that when you're in the midst of something that might be really challenging, and maybe you can't step away at the moment, um, whether you can or can't, I would highly recommend to pick a time where you are able to step away and say, hey, you know what, later today, I'm going to go on a walk. Or this weekend, I'm going to go um, and maybe I'm going to do a run or maybe I'm going to find time for a 30-minute massage to put on a schedule. So I think giving yourself the concept and the idea that there is time for you too is really important, that self-care is so essential to make sure that we make time for and model that to your students. If you have that mindfulness corner like you talked about, which I wish I had in my classroom, step in there yourself. Let the kids see you blowing the bubbles and you setting a timer for yourself um, because that's that's something they need to see, that everybody needs it. Lastly, I know we mentioned this, you have a beautiful website, but um, if the audience wants to continue connecting with you in the future, what would be the best way for them to keep the conversation going? Um, definitely connect with me on Twitter, Instagram. Um, those are where I am most of the time. I am on Facebook, but I'm most active when it comes to this conversation on Twitter and Instagram. So it's my name. So it's at Elisa Bostwick. So it's half of my first name. Excellent. Thank you. We will we'll link to uh, your website, your social media handles, and your book as well all on our show notes page which can be found at powereduup.com slash show 20. Liz, thank you so much. Uh, this was this was awesome. This was um, a topic that I am super passionate about. Um, so I hope I didn't hog the mic from you too much tonight, Matt, but I was, I was very excited by many of these topics. Um, so your kids were clearly very lucky to have you as a teacher, your districts where you were a coach. Um, clearly, we're learning a lot from you, and I encourage everyone to reach out to you and, and tap into you as a consulting resource now for themselves personally or for their districts to help 
push some of these initiatives. So thanks again for your time. Uh, everyone, thank you for, as always, for tuning into our show. If you haven't already, please subscribe wherever you're watching or listening. And most of all, share this with other, edu other educators that you think can benefit from this specific show with Liz or from any of our other shows that you may or may not have checked out yet. We talk to amazing educators every week. And I mean, Matt and I are on an incredible journey. We are learning so much and really recentering ourselves as educators. And, and we just want as many teachers as possible to, to hear and learn from this. So Liz, thanks again. And Matt, why don't you uh, why don't you sign us off? So as we power down this episode, uh, Liz, you've left us feeling extra powered up. Thank you so much for your time, and everyone will talk to you next week. Thank you.